morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. I think we might have a couple couple stragglers wandering in, but we'll um, want to get things underway. My name is Darcy White with Clarion Associates. We're part of the team that's working with the city uh, to do uh, the general plan update, and wanted to give you a quick overview of where we are in the process and how, how things are progressing. We were last here in September and had a whole series of meetings, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about that and kind of where we're headed from here. So thanks very much for coming this morning. Um, appreciate the interest and um, hope to get some good feedback along the way. Um, so one of the things to, um, if you're new to the process, just to clarify is that we're, we've been asked to do two things um, with the city. We're working on both the general plan update as well as the development code update, and that's important. Um, we're, we're working on the policy end of things, which is really kind of the guidance, um, the, the big picture guidance for the community, as well as the regulatory framework. So those are two different things. Um, my colleague Kristen Sazowski is working um, heavily on the, the development code update, and so um, the ability for us to, to coordinate those two efforts is something that doesn't happen very often, so it's, it's very uh, forward thinking for the city to try to tackle these things simultaneously. But the, the goal is really to make sure that um, once the plan is adopted, that you have the, the regulations in place, the right tools in place to help implement the plan. So those things are going on at the same time. So if you're following the meetings, um, you, you'll notice on the project website, you know, there's different, different meetings for different topics. So if you're particularly interested in the plan, you'll look for those meetings, and, but there are, are also separate meetings on the code happening as well. In terms of the general plan, um, this is really the long range plan for the community. It's a 10 to 20 year plan, um, and it really looks at how and where the city will grow. Um, and there's a lot of components that go along with that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, housing, transportation, a lot of different things that influence that. And again, this is the, the policy end of, of the, the city's growth framework, not the regulatory framework. So um, deals with things like the community vision, um, goals and policies, um, to help support that vision, and then ultimately some recommended actions to help move the plan forward. So the last time that this process uh, occurred in a major way, as it is now, was in 2002. Um, there was a, a big process then. A number of people we've, we've uh, met along the way have participated, participated in that earlier process as well. So it's nice to have some continuity, some perspective about where the community was in 2002 and, and where you are today and, and kind of use that as context for going forward. One of the uh, triggers, if you will, for this uh, plan update is really that the city has grown um, a fair amount since 2002. You've since reached the 50,000 population threshold, which requires a series of new elements or topics to be addressed in the general plan. So that's something, uh, one of the major things that we're focused on as part of this update is, is dealing with some of those new requirements uh, for uh, the plan, as well as looking at some technical amendments. Anytime you have a plan like this, you know, your data becomes outdated. There's a lot of things that just need to be freshened up after that period of time. So those are quite a few things we're working on with that as well. So with those new requirements, you can see on the left side is really what's in the general plan today. So the 2002 general plan dealt with a fairly short list of topics, land use, growth management, transportation, open space, and cost of development. So those were kind of the required elements at the time uh, for where the city was. And you can see that that list has expanded on the right um, now that the city has grown. So there are a number of new things that we need to also address um, in the black letters. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these, so don't, don't worry if you can't read the details. But um, a, whole, a whole series of new things that need to be addressed in the plan. Um, and just to be clear, um, while these are, are new requirements, it doesn't mean that the 2002 plan didn't touch on these things already. Obviously, it dealt with housing, it dealt with uh, safety and public services, those types of things, but they were more integrated into the plan throughout. So we're basically uh, strengthening those components in the plan and um, expanding them to, to meet the new requirements. We have been um, reaching out to the community in a variety of different ways. Um, we have had our last public meeting I mentioned in September, but we've had basically meetings almost uh, once a month, every other month, either on the code or the plan update. And so we're really anxious to get as much feedback as we can. We have also um, had materials available on the city's website. There is a general plan 
um, and code update page. Um, and each time we're doing one of these uh, general plan meetings, we're also making available online uh, a, a, um, a survey, kind of a comment form. So if you're if you're more comfortable, you know, want to sit down and kind of write out comments, we're happy to take them that way. But if you're if you're more of a technology person and it's easier to type your thoughts down, we have that option available. I think we had about 25 or 30 people weigh in after our meetings uh, last time online. So it's just another way to kind of get the information out there. So if uh, there are folks you uh, think might be interested in participating that way, please let them know that that material is available. Um, we also have a general plan advisory committee we'll be meeting with again um, later this morning at 1130. And that's about, uh, I think we've got 15 folks on that committee that are really more of a, a focus group to give us some time to dig into the, the nuts and bolts of the plan um, and help us shape that. Um, we also have another community meeting scheduled this evening um, at six o'clock, six to eight, I think. Um, and uh, so lots of different opportunities for input um, throughout the process. In terms of where we are, we kicked off the project back in um, April, and we are moving right along. Um, we are in the midst of pulling together the, the draft plan. What we have tonight, uh, this morning, is a, kind of the, the two-thirds draft of the, the preliminary document. So we're working through the different elements as we go. Um, we'll be shooting to uh, pull together the final draft, the complete draft, in the December time frame. And then beyond that, there will be um, a period of time for review and, and input before that document gets finalized. So, so you're here at a good time to, to help shape the project. Um, one of the other things that's available, we did early in the process, if you're interested in some of the background information about Lake Havasu, um, population trends, housing, all of the kind of the data behind the plan is available in draft form on the project website. Um, so that's something you might want to take a look at if you're interested in, in some of those um, topics that are listed up there. We've got a lot more data available that way. Um, and that really draws upon some of the, uh, the trends and key issues that we've heard uh, from folks throughout the process. And, you know, I think there are a variety of things that will, you know, beyond the, the, the new requirements that really will help shape this process. And that means that, um, even though the city has grown a fair amount over the last 10 years, you've added about 10,000 residents since 2002, growth is going to continue to occur. And so having the, the, the framework in place to guide that growth is going to be important. Um, based on the projections uh, right now, we're looking at about 67,000 people by 2040. And it seems like a long time away, but things happen in a progress, pr progressively. And so I think being able to respond to those things is something that the plan can help the city do. A um, couple other issues I'll mention, you can kind of see um, a whole host of things that we've heard um, raised by the community and others through this process so far. Um, the population trend in Lake Havasu, which is similar to other parts of the nation, is that the, the population is getting older. So that brings with it new uh, considerations for housing and services and, and how um, those uh, considerations work within the community. Land use can Compatibility has been a big consideration for folks um, through the process in terms of how do residential neighborhoods relate to uh, commercial development adjacent. Um, those types of things have been con concerns and, and considerations. Um, multimodal transportation has been a big uh, conversation. Uh, pe pedestrian and bicycle accessibility as well as vehicles. Um, so that just gives you a sense of kind of the, the types of things that we have been looking at and trying to make sure that as we are pulling together uh, draft materials for the plan that you have policies in place to address some of these things and that ultimately the development code um, has uh, tools in place as well to, to deal with some of those things. Um, so I want to just give you a quick highlight of some of the preliminary draft chapters that we have uh, available and um, if you haven't picked up a copy there are some on the table in the back um, and basically we are, are kind of working through as we go, um, you can see in the introductory section, really gives you all the details. If you're interested in, in learning more about the different plan elements, what's required, what do we need to tackle, um, that chart that, that's shown there on the right kind of gives you a breakdown of all the different components. You know, within growth management, we have uh, environmental conservation, water, energy, a lot of different things that get addressed within a particular section. So that will help you uh, get through 
kind of an understanding of those types of things within housing and neighborhoods. We deal with not just general housing issues, but also neighborhood conservation issues, for example. So um, that's an important thing to look at as you're reviewing the materials and um, should help orient you to particular things that you're interested in. Um, one of the things that we've looked at as part of this process is, is the community vision. And um, you got this in your document, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to read this to you, but I think one of the things we did when we were here in September was primarily focused on having the community tell us um, how do you feel about the vision. Um, this is something that actually emerged from, goes back to 1996, and it's, it's primarily been, um, it's been vetted with the community. I think there were some, su some suggestions we received about making it, um, you know, just tweaking the language a little bit here and there to make it feel more forward. Um, you know, some specific suggestions that happened, but essentially it's, it's um, relatively intact as it has been for quite some time. And so that's something we're continuing to move forward with until we, until we hear differently. Um, but I think the, the feedback we got um, based on, the, you know, what had happened in 90, 1996 as well as 2002 is that this continues to be um, the, a, a vision that resonates with the community. And so that's, that for now um, will be the foundation for the plan moving forward. So getting into um, some of the topics where we do have some uh, preliminary draft chapters put together, and there's basically a, kind of three tiers to the policy framework in each of these chapters. We've got kind of a high level uh, vision statement for each of those. So those are the guiding principles. And, I'm, um, and then within that, we have specific goals and policies that help support and, and implement those guiding principles. So. Um, you have all the details in front of you, so I'm not going to go into to all of those for each of these topics, but I wanted to just give you a sense of kind of what's driving um, the policy framework in each of these chapters. So for housing and neighborhoods, you can see um, a number of issues that were raised through the, through the process so far, um, increasing the, the variety of housing types in the community. Um, infill is a big thing. Um, Havasu is surrounded by public land, so in terms of uh, opportunities for growth, um, at least the first option is really to look inward and try to use up uh, some of those parcels that remain in the community. Um, so there are some, some policies to guide that type of development. We've heard concerns about homelessness and transitional housing and how those things fit into the community. Um, uh, balancing tourism and, and neighborhood stability, that's another consideration in terms of um, uh, how do rental, uh, vacation rentals, and those types of things fit into the community. So, so guiding principles for housing and neighborhoods really focus on um, broadening the mix of housing types, um, thinking about not just where the population is today and who lives here today, but longer term. So if we think about that aging population, um, nationally we're seeing more and more that uh, communities are seeking to allow folks to, to age in place, and that basically means, you know, giving uh, this, providing the support services needed to allow people to stay in their homes longer, to uh, get the care they need and kind of um, stay with, uh, within their communities in places that they're comfortable rather than necessarily having to move into a, a, a long-term care facility. Um, other options are accessory housing dwelling, accessory housing, accessory dwelling units, um, so smaller homes uh, or smaller units that might be within an existing home or you might have, sometimes we call those granny flats, um, you might have an older parent living with you at home um, or in the, uh, the unit above the garage, that type of thing. Um, so a whole range of, of ways that housing can be expanded. Um, protection of established neighborhoods is also a big issue uh, within this topic. And we talked a little bit about some of those issues, primarily the compatibility with um, adjacent commercial and making sure that the, the development code has uh, appropriate regulations in place to uh, guide that in terms of what types of, of provisions are required in terms of whether it's landscaping or buffers, that, that type of thing. So that's something that uh, Kristen and our other colleague Don are working on with the development code. In terms of circulation, um, this is a chapter that's very much a work in progress. Um, one of the things that happen with the, uh, the 50,000 population trigger is that um, the city of Lake Havasu also has a new metropolitan planning organization. Um, Jean Knight heads that organization up. She's in the back here. I'll put her on the spot a little bit. But basically, they are working on um, putting together uh, a more regional transportation plan um, that will be kicking off here 
in the next month or so. And so that process really will help inform this circulation element for the city proper. And so that's something that we'll be coordinating with them. Um, you can, you'll find in the draft uh, kind of the, the key issues that we've heard so far um, that we think really should be considered as part of their process as well as this process. And those included things like uh, the pedestrian and bicycle considerations, um, you know, circulation between different parts of the city. Public transportation has obviously a been a big uh, conversation here recently. So those are all things that we'll be looking at um, both as part of this process, but as well as, uh, as part of the MPO plan. And ultimately, what we envision happening is that, you know, the, the, the results of the MPO process, which will be much more detailed and get into a lot of the nitty-gritty details of transportation, will then feed back into this uh, general plan before it gets adopted. So that one, you've got kind of an initial take of what we think will probably be in that section, um, but there will be more detail that, you know, more guidance that will come out of that MPO process. So stay tuned on that one. Um, open space and, and recreation, um, also a big focus for the community. Obviously, recreation is a big driving force, a big quality of life consideration in Lake Havasu, and so a lot of interest in this topic. Um, and there have been more detailed studies done on this topic since 2002. So we've got more information to work from in terms of uh, uh, recent work on, on parks and recreation. Um, guiding principles here really look at you know, the, the range of services that are provided for the community um, and thinking again, not just about a particular segment of the community, but do we have uh, services that uh, you know, are, are of interest to older adults? Do we have uh, facilities and, and opportunities for younger um, families and, and folks who live in the community, as well as um, balancing the need of visitors to the community, because that's a key factor in Lake Havasu's economy. So a lot of, of, of challenges and opportunities there, as well as um, in terms of parks and recreation. Um, other guiding principles there, um, clearly the, the natural environment of Lake Havasu is a, is a big amenity. That's one of the things that makes La Lake Havasu unique. And so open space, uh, um, protection of natural resources, those are all things that are very important um, to the community and something that the plan seeks to, to carry forward. So scenic quality, uh, making sure you've got connections and access to those different resources um, is something that, that the community would like to see carry forward is what, is what we're hearing. And the last component here, um, healthy, livable, engaging environment. And really what that means is, you know, there are other aspects to quality of life and kind of what makes a community uh, a, a great place to live. You know, we've heard um, interest in uh, arts and culture. The plan in 2002 had a series of policies about arts and culture and, and how that fits into the community. That's something we're carrying forward and kind of expanding. Um, opportunities for social engagement, you know, and that may be just kind of an offshoot of, of recreation where you've got uh, places in the community where you can gather um, and, and uh, interact with one another. And so those are the types of things that really shape the policies in the um, open space and recreation chapter. Public facilities and services, you know, this is never the most exciting topic for most people, but I think in a in a desert environment like Lake Havasu, this is a really critical conversation. Um, this deals with things like, uh, you know, how, how, thinking about where you grow and, and how are you doing that efficiency efficiently. Um, sewer, water, you know, basic infrastructure like that, and making sure that um, you know that happens in a way that that is cost effective and um, and uh, makes sense for the long term health of the community. So this also deals with things like police and fire. As you grow as a community, you're obviously going to need more more people to support um, you know the, that level of service that that uh, the community is uh, used to getting. And so there's there's considerations there that we look at in terms of of those types of services. And the last one um, that we have in the packet today is community safety. And this is one of the new topics. And it, it's a little, um, uh, you know, I think at first blush, you think, well, this deals with police and fire, you know, as much as um, public facilities. But really what the community safety element is about in the statutes is um, hazard mitigation. And this is kind of a something that's been um, a more pressing um, a more uh, visible con uh, discussion in recent years across the country. But I think, you know, in Lake Havasu, back in August, you guys had some pretty serious 
um, flooding considerations and things that happen, you know, during the monsoon season. So f flood and wash uh, conditions, those types of things. Um, and it also gets to just uh, emergency preparedness issues. And this is something, again, that there's been a lot of work done since 2002 that we, we can build on in terms of coordination within the region. Um, Lake Havasu has um, a number of documents that they have uh, plans in place to deal with, work with others in the region, um, should there be some sort of uh, event that were to occur. Um, also have uh, information available to help uh, individuals prepare for uh, natural disasters and those types of things. How can you make sure that as uh, you know, you and your family have things in place to, to kind of uh, get through a, a tough situation should that occur? So this is a new element um, and something that, um, again, we had a, a fair amount to work from, I think, in terms of what the community has already been doing on this topic. So that's kind of where we are in terms of what's you know in draft form now the other topics that we are working on and got a lot of feedback on in september so there's these are kind of uh, a little bit more detailed um, the growth management element which really deals with um, where the community can grow based on water availability um, based on services those types of things so that's something we ha we have have in draft form we're working with staff on um, and the land use element, this is a biggie. So you think about a general plan and a lot of people think of that land use map and that's something we're taking a look at. Um, you know, I think fundamentally we don't envision it changing dramatically, um, but what we've heard through the process so far is, you know, there's just a, a few places where the map needs to be updated um, to reflect what's happened over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. But we're also hearing um, interest in kind of uh, punching out, if you will, the policies for different parts of the community. There's been work done, um, you know, on downtown, for example. There's work been done on the shoreline. There are a lot of different areas of the community where we can provide more tailored policy guidance. So rather than just looking at the community as a whole, the goal with the land use element is to be able to um, provide some of those details, a little bit more guidance for different parts of the community. Another area that's been brought up is the, um, the area surrounding the ASU campus. You know, how, what policies do we need to have in place to support um, continued growth of the campus, facilities for students over time, those types of things. So that's something that's a work in progress and um, we'll have available the next time we come. Um, economic development is another new chapter and this, you know, I think in the 2002 plan, this was something that was dealt with in the land use section. There were a few policies, but um, I think this is an area where there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration with other organizations in the community who are already working on efforts, uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, for example, um, others who are, are working on different um, opportunities to really build on the assets that the community has and, and you know, how does that relate to um, how the community uh, envisions moving forward. And so that's something we're also working through. And then the last thing, um, which is really kind of the, 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 the pivotal section of the whole plan, will be thinking about all those policies and, and vision ideas that the community has. How do we kind of, how do we move those forward? And so the action plan will, will take each of those chapters and provide some recommended actions. And those may be things that are, uh, new programs. Um, that's one way to implement some, um, some of these policies. They may, ne may be new regulatory um, uh, guidance in different areas. And again, that's something that, that the city is working on concurrently. So we'll have the ability to um, address those recommendations in the you know, very near future as part of that process. Um, and they may be things that are happening on an ongoing basis. So there's a lot of work that um, the city does in terms of collaborating with other organizations in the region um, that are really important. So they're working with um, uh, the county, they're working with ADOT, they're working with MPO um, and others. And it's, so it's important to think about not just um, you know how these recommendations affect the city specifically, but that it really takes partnerships. And, and so trying to identify those partnerships and, and um, uh, document that in the plan as a way to kind of help move forward will be an important part of this process. In terms of next steps, um, as I mentioned, we do have um, this material as well as an online comment form available on the city's website. Um, and that will be up, um, you know, through the end of the month, um, uh, through the end of November, certainly. 
um, until we come back. So we'll just kind of keep that going. We, we are, as we're working on sections, we're reviewing comments as they come in. So that's really helpful to us if, if you have time or know others who um, want to provide their feedback that way. Um, and then we'll be coming back sometime in the December um, time frame with the, the remaining chapters and then any updates to these existing chapters that we have based on the feedback we get today. Um, Kristen and Don will be back in January to talk about the next module on the development code, which will deal with um, the districts, the zoning districts that really help implement the land use map. So, so you'll start to see these two processes really coming together at that point because I think changes that are made on the land use plan really need to be reflected in the code. And so um, you'll start to see how those things um, relate a little bit more clearly as that process um, gets into its next phase as well. So with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, we do have comment forms there. If you want to take time and look at stuff now, grab myself or Kristen or Stu um, and ask questions about things, or I'm happy to happy to answer any questions anyone has right off the bat. And I think Stu's got a microphone we've got to use if, if you do have questions. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Oh, wonderful. Would it be fair to assume, since I'm unfamiliar with the MPO process, that it will address the major need to uh, deal with long-term improvement of the roads and intersections? I'm going to turn to Jean here and let her answer that question. I'll answer your question. Basically, when we do the transportation study, it takes into consideration all of the um, components of transit, trans the roads, uh, trails, bike, ped, and it looks at, it doesn't come in and say you have to fix this because we do have roads that is cost prohibitive to change. So, but what it will do is it will spell out areas of po potential improvements that can be, that will be presented to the executive board as well as the city. Did that answer your question, sir? No? <laughs> We've just been dealing with road problems for a long time in this community, and I don't think that uh, uh, that we should. We, sh in other words, I think we should address it through this kind of a program because it's a long-term need, based on economics. It really is. One of the assets that we would have, I think personally, is that if we looked at 10 or 20 years, we could put curbs in. We could t put possible sidewalks, but we could correct the intersections that need to be done that we haven't done for many years. So that's just my personal opinion on that. If I could just comment on that. I know that one of the things that when they do a transportation study, they, they don't take into consideration that curb issue. They do take into consideration how the flow of the traffic is at different intersections and make potential recommendations, as well as look at funding for those issues. The same thing with sidewalks, and I agree with you. I'd love to have sidewalks. They're not cheap. But that will be taken into consideration in the study, as well as the cost, the cost component and the potential funding for those cost components. And then it's not always thrown on the back of the city to come up with all of those, but it has different uh, mechanisms that we can look at on the federal level. Since they're mandating this, we look at it on the federal level for potential fundings for those things. And so the city's not totally liable financially for all of those improvements. So they make their recommendations in that study. In light of the recent power outages we had due to downed power lines and quite a number of them over a period of a couple of months, is there anything in the plan to allow for bearing all of our power lines? I had heard that at one point in the beginning of the city formation it was talked about but somehow never got done due to, to the cost uh, or the difficulty with the terrain. But isn't there a way, this day and age, with our engineering capability, to come up with a solution to bury the power lines? That would enhance the appearance of Lake Havasu, not just for tourism, but for general habitability. 
That's a question that um, that has come up through the process so far, and where it's addressed right now is in that community safety um, section. And basically, you know, similar to the sidewalk situation, it's really difficult to come in and just wholesale do them all at the same time. But what the plan suggests is that where there are opportunities to tackle that issue at the same time as other improvements, that that would be the most efficient and effective way to do that. So it's definitely flagged as an issue. I think in terms of there being a you know a specific action plan about you know how and where and all of that we don't get to that level of detail in the general plan but we've certainly captured that issue and, and why it's important other questions comments actually the reason i came today was about your open space and recreation um, I have a um, an, um, chemical engineering background, but I'm also I have become very spiritual in my old age, and uh, I have discovered ten different vortex sites in and around Lake Havasu. And if you're familiar with the Sedona vortex sites, they're places for healing. Here in Havasu, our um, mineral makeup in the ground, a lot of quartz, gold, copper. These elements are very conducive for healing, whereas in Sedona, they have a lot of iron and their vortex energy, yes, conducive to healing, but it's also highly energetic relative to here. Ours is mild and nurturing. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of vortex energy and the benefits of it. However, the 10 sites I have found, six of them are within the city limits. And if there was some way we could designate them as separate vortex energy sites, whatever needs to be done in order to bring that designation about, that would add to a tourism flow that would increase another aspect of our economic development. Sedona has fared very well with its um, cost-benefit side of using spirituality as a tourism draw. It's something that has not been tapped here in Havasu as yet, but it is a potential where the bottom line actually can improve our cash flow here in the city. I just had a mind, body, spirit fair. People came in from Vegas. They came down from Kingman, all over Mojave County and La Paz County for the mind, body, spirit fair because there's nothing in the area that con that is similar to it. Uh, Laughlin used to have a psychic fair which had a big draw. Tropicana made a lot of money on that psychic fair. They're no longer doing it. So. In this open space and recreation section, I would like to drop a proposal or introduce a proposal to the powers that be making the decisions that would allow for long-term look at the use of developing the spirituality aspect of Lake Havasu City. Thank you. That's interesting. That's not something we've heard um, through the process yet and something I haven't heard of, I'll, I'll be honest, in, at all. Um, um, but I think where, where you're right, it kind of fits into the context of, you know, other things that are happening is that the economic development section absolutely focuses on events and other activities that bring in people. And so I think um, certainly something we can take a look at. Um, she, the question was, who, who should she give the proposal to? I think if you want to document um, that recommendation on your comment form, we are, you know, we are tracking all of those things and making them available um, online as well as to um, the elected officials as well. So. Solar panel use. Wait, he's trying to. <laughs> the question was, where in the where in the plan are we addressing solar panel panel use? Um, that comes up in the energy element, um, and, and that's something Kristen and I were talking about earlier. The city does have um, regulations um, that allow for um, solar um, and ener uh, alternative energy facilities. So, if there's a particular issue that we need to be looking at, I think where the plan is addressing it is is really to support those as part of the overall growth and that that's something to be a more sustainable community. Um, you know, that's something that should be encouraged. But I guess my question back to you would be, is there, is there a particular issue or concern that we should be thinking about with regard to that that we haven't thought of? Well, the, the city now is, is uh, if you approach them about putting in your own system, uh, they have nothing there. They refer you to a, a company to have it done. So that I was wondering if you were addressing at all any type of uh, uh, new regulation that allows the homeowner 
to uh, install what he needs. So, Stu, I'm going to ask Stu to respond to that one in terms of where, where things are right now. Um, we have specific code sections within the, the zoning portion um, that encourage that type of use, limit it somewhat in, with regard to setbacks, that kind of thing. Um, however, in the building code, th they address them purely from uh, the, the building standpoint. Um, at this point, I don't know that we're doing anything or have any incentives to encourage those. Um, however, that's something we could take a look at, put a policy or several policies in the general plan um, moving forward to enhance that, uh, that opportunity. Okay. Yeah, and in terms of the development code side, um, we've done a lot of work on helping communities try to, to streamline the process, remove barriers for solar and other types of facilities. So it's something we can take a closer look at. Other questions or comments? Uh, thanks. Um, I was just wondering on the demographics and the trend package is if how you included the snowbird effect, you know, because the population I've been told it almost like it increases by like 50, 60 percent. And so obviously if you're talking about a population you're supporting of 90,000 versus 60,000, right, it's a big difference on where you plan. It's a great question. Um, I think it's harder. It's a harder thing to do in reality in terms of the census and trying to keep track of those people. But I think where it comes into play um, is really thinking about those long-term opportunities. Um, and you know, if a business a business needs to be able to survive with the base population as well as the you know kind of the you can't just rely on that temporary population. So we tend to plan somewhere in the middle thinking that you know, you're going to have a range in there. And that's kind of um, how we tend to operate in terms of these plans, is really looking at what the, what the, the max might be, what the minimum might be. But I think from the, just from the fundamental population standpoint, we're using that as our base, but we're definitely making sure to acknowledge that you do have those fluctuations um, at different times of the year. And I think you know, Stu and I were talking earlier, it's you know, plus or minus 10%, 15%. I mean, it depends on the event and the time of year. but um, certainly it's a it's a factor but not one you can kind of hang your hat on fully either so other questions or comments well, kind of just tied to that uh -huh. is what it caught my attention was the 67,000 forecast right the 67,000 forecast for 25 years from now sounds like a real real slow growth rate and so if you're off right you, and you're putting it into a 20-year plan you're now maybe not prepared, right? Because we've already, we've grown almost that much in the last 10 years is what we're projecting for the next 25 years. Sure, and a couple things we looked at with that, um, it, t it turns out to be about a 1% growth rate, which it sounds small, but it's actually not real um, too far off. I mean, when, when um, Arizona, Nevada were going through kind of crazy growth a few years ago. We all remember that. And, you know, you were getting three, three and a half percent places like the Las Vegas Valley. I mean, those were really aggressive growth rates. So um, we did our research, looked at a variety of different kind of projections on that. Um, this, the state projections take into account um, the fact that we're coming out of a recession. Um, we've, we saw growth between 2000 and 2008 that we're not likely to see in the near future. So it's it's sort of taking an average of those kind of really high times and the really slow years and you you know again you're going to you're going to have some of that but we are trying to look at you know a balance between those two things. But I think um, I think the 1% is still kind of within very much within in the realm of reason based on what we're seeing now with the city coming out of the recession in terms of permit activity has started to pick up but it's still drastically different than it was, you know, six or seven years ago before the recession. Um, so it's, it's not a, it's definitely not a, a magic number by any means. Um, so those are all things to, to kind of consider. Other questions, comments? Stu? Um, why don't you go over with them just the fact that um, now that they have the information, if they choose they have the ability to read review it and if they have comments you can do them online or you can submit them to my email address and I'll make sure they get to um, I'll, I'll make sure they get to the consultant yeah you have it. 
up there no it is um, it's on the city's website if that helps if you go to the general plan page um, all the information's there so um, if you if you do the survey monkey thing we'll all get it um, if you want to send a note to Stu directly his information is on there as well so number where we're done that we can't build any more can't grow any more than have is there any forecast for a complete completed growth the complete build out of the land use plan which goes pretty far beyond um, the existing city limits um, is I think around is it 97,000 Stu it's it's it, it's an estimate um, but I think what what is probably a more realistic limitation before land would be a limitation would be water. And so those are factors that, you know, are kind of balanced. The city um, has a, a, a water boundary that they maintain and monitor. That's something that's being looked at. Um, so land, yeah, it's a constraint mainly from a, you know, just land availability standpoint more so than a long-term availability issue. So, you know, there's always ways to work around that. Water's a little tougher to, to kind of work through. So. But yeah, the ultimate build out, I think there's questions whether, you know, are you going to get to that point? Are you going to be able to get to that point based on kind of water availability and other challenges like that? So, but the land area would be there ultimately. Any other questions or comments? Um, well, like I said, we'll be here um, until 11. Um, so if you have questions, you want to grab one of us one on one, feel free to do that. Um, and if you know of others who you think ought to be here to, to participate, we do have that meeting this evening um, starting at six o'clock. So we would encourage you to um, nudge your friends and family and folks who think um, would be part of this should be part of this process. We would really appreciate that. And um, thank you all for coming and um, hope to see you again in, in December when we're back. So thanks very much.